Hey everybody, welcome back to 10% True. I'm really pleased to be bringing you this, the first in a four-part interview with BC Thomas, Lieutenant Colonel, US Air Force, retired, and high-time SR-71 Blackbird pilot. I don't think that BC does too many interviews, so I was really pleased that he agreed to talk to me. We've got about six hours of conversation. I've whittled that down to about four and a half, five hours of interview for you to listen to. And there are four parts. So this first part covers BC's early career going through pilot training and the flying he did prior to reaching the SR-71. Part two talks about the aircraft itself. It's more of a technical exploration of the aircraft uh, with some reference to the peculiarities of how it operated, how the engines worked, how it managed to fly so high and so fast. Part three is a conversation around some of the operational missions that he flew and the culture in the SR-71 community. And then part four will be an AMA and a bunch of random questions that I forgot to ask the first time round. At any rate, I really hope you enjoy it. It really was a, a privilege and a pleasure for me to speak to BC. BC, if you happen to be listening to this, thank you for your time. And for everyone listening, uh, please like, subscribe, share, help me grow the channel. And of course, most importantly, enjoy. BC, you, you have the distinction of being the highest time SR-71 pilot. Uh, we appreciate you having you on the channel. Looking forward to talking to you about that. Uh, as usual, for 10% True, the place we'll start, though, is the beginning. Um, so... Can I ask you, how did you get into the business of flying? Well, it's um, it really started when I was three or four years old. And uh, I, I was born three weeks before Pearl Harbor. And uh, my dad I was born in 1909, so he was 31 when the war started. And he had a government job and two children, so he was exempt from, from the draft. But he, uh, all of his friends went to World War II. And he really bugged my mother, and he, he really wanted to serve. So finally, in 1944, he, he joined the Navy. And um, when he uh, went for the Navy, uh, left for the Navy, he, uh, he gave me a hard rubber, I don't think they had plastic then, but a hard rubber airplane. And it was about this long and had a prop and everything. And um, I was three years old. I thought it was really a neat, neat thing. And... I started playing with that, and then I started imagining what three-dimensional freedom would be like. Of course, I didn't have the term three-dimensional freedom, but it was left, right, up and down, fast and slow, and land and zoom and go straight up and straight down and loops and rolls, and it just fascinated me. And uh, I, I never lost that bug. I just I really wanted to be a pilot. Now, it was kind of unusual because both of my parents hated flying. Uh, my mother, any time that she went flying to uh, visit one of us or something, she had to take tranquilizers. And um, I, I'm very proud of them because I, at the time I didn't realize it because I was, you know, 18 or so when I went to college. And um, they were not at all uh, unsupportive. They, they were. They said you should do anything that you want to do. And looking back now, it must have scared the heck out of them the talk that I had because I, I, I wanted to go to a college that had Air Force ROTC, which I did, Southern Methodist University in Dallas, and um, I wanted to be a pilot. That was my burning desire forever that I can remember. And so when I went to SMU I, and went to ROTC, and well, I, I could tell you a, a slight story about how I got into flying, but it um, the, the first time let me back up. My parents, my dad was a mail clerk, and uh, so he was essentially a blue collar, um, lower middle class uh, family. We didn't have much money, but I didn't know it because it was a very loving family, a very supportive family. And we had everything that we needed. Dad took me to the state fair and things like that. It was, I had a very nice, nice uh, growing up. So when I got to, uh, uh, SMU, when I got out of, um, out of Den uh, Denison, Texas, it's my hometown. Uh, when I went to SMU, then uh, any, I, I had um, a job working in the student center at SMU. And any extra money I had, I would go to uh, the local airport to, an air to uh, get a ride in the Piper Cub. And uh, I only got about 
10 or 15 flights in, in a Piper Cub and not in an instructional way. It wasn't a, it wasn't a dedicated instruction. I just wanted to fly. And um, when I went to, uh, our, in, in ROTC, there's uh, between the junior and senior year, we had a program called Summer Training Unit, which is essentially boot camp. It was a six weeks long boot camp. And during that time, I got the chance to fly in a jet, a T-33. And uh, it was, uh, it was I, I still remember that flight. It was wonderful. Um, jumping ahead, after I got checked out in, in the Air Force, I took other cadets and people like that flying. And it was, I, I, the, the pilot that took me in the T-33 must have been surprise because I asked him to do everything. I said, you know, he says, well, what do you want to do? And I said, well, first of all, I, I'm always wondering what a cloud was like. Could you fly through a cloud? <laughs> so he did that. And then I asked, you know, I says, well, can you show me your, your whole repertoire? <laughs> Rolls, loops, uh, dives, cubinates, and all that. And he did. And it's the first time I'd ever experienced, uh, you know, more than a half a G. And he, he, he racked it up into a four, four and a half, five G's. And it, it was, I couldn't believe the sensation that that was. It just felt like all of my insides were going to come out. And I, I was thinking, these guys do this for a living. It's a, that's remarkable. And I, I'm, I was really surprised physiologically that the body could take that kind of stuff, but I didn't uh, throw up or anything. And I came back and it was just wonderful. I, when I took people flying later in my career, Almost all of them got sick, and it wasn't because I wanted to. It was just the new experience of, of uh, high-speed flight. So he he must have been impressed. <laughs> so um, at the same time at that uh, summer training unit, I flunked my physical to be a pilot. It was my eyes. I flunked. I came in at 2025, 20, and 2020 20 was the uh, was the limit. And so I was disqualified then from the flight and, uh, in, uh, introduction program, the FIP program, which allowed ROTC students to uh, take flying lessons while their senior year in college. So I didn't, I didn't get to do that. So, um, so from a flying point of view then, so you, you got some time in a Piper Cub. It wasn't uh, instructional. Had, had you taken control of it? Had you actually? Oh, yes. yes. And, and, and if it's not an odd question... Um, was your response instinctive to that experience? You know, were you able to instinctively manipulate the controls in a way that got the airplane to do what you wanted it to do? Well, I knew what the controls were supposed to do. And so um, just, yes, left, right, up, down, fast and slow. That's, 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 that's what the controls do. And uh, yeah, I, would say, I wouldn't say that I was uh, instinctively the best pilot in the world. I, I, no, nothing like that. But um, I, I, I had nothing to compare it to. So the, uh, the instructor was very good. He's rode in the back as the old uh, uh, yellow colored Piper Cub. And it's a wonderful airplane. And um, the only thing that he criticized me about was that I assumed that um, if you put full power on it, that you could go essentially straight up. Well, that's, of course, that's not true. <laughs> so he, he uh, admonished me not to not to stall it out unless I was really meaning to do that. Um, but I, I never landed it. I never mastered the landing when I was in college. That was when I was in pilot training. When I went to pilot training, I was the only guy who had not soloed an airplane. Right. Um, we had about uh, thirty in our class. Did, did did it live up to the expectation then? I mean, it's, it's really interesting. You say that as a sort of four year old, you had wondered at a sense of freedom to be able to move in three dimensions of course you couldn't as you say articulate those thoughts but but the, the wonderment was there um did it live up to expectations then realizing that you were confined you couldn't go into the vertical in, in a piper cub my my um, first impression was how beautiful the, the earth is and how peaceful it looks and uh, i enjoyed seeing things on the ground and people and all that and uh, and, and going having three-dimensional freedom is just a very, very good feeling. When, when you flew the T-33, then it's curious that you you asked to fly through a, a cloud. 
Uh, and, and your degree, you, you'll, I'm sure, talk about it uh, shortly, but your degree was a, a science degree. Um, you, you ended up going to test pilot school. Um, so presumably, you know, there's a mathematical um, sort of element that runs through you. Uh, were you as interested in the science as you were in the sort of visceral experience of flight? I, uh, I, I, I was self-taught aerodynamics. Um, I didn't take a course in aerodynamics. I was a, uh, a math major as an undergraduate, and uh, then I specialized in mathematical and experimental statistics in, in graduate school. There, there's a story about how I got back on flying status, if you wanted to hear <laughs> that. I, uh, when I flunked my uh, eye test, that was in 1963, I came back to my old ROTC unit <clears throat> and told the professor of air science, Colonel Durian, wonderful guy, I, I was just crushed. I, I, I just, I, I wanted to be a pilot. And he says, well, you could possibly be a navigator. And, Sir, I do not want to be a navigator. Well, I'm, I'm talking to Colonel Darian, who is a navigator. <laughs> and, and he uh, he understood and he said, I, I understand. Uh, you know, so he said that he, he was in the same boat too, but he he had he uh, he couldn't get into pilot training. And he told me, he says, your your eyes are just marginal. So what you should do, this is in, in Dallas, uh, Texas, says, um, go go to an ophthalmologist, go to an optometrist, uh, go to people who know eyes, and get exercise, whatever it takes and see if you can better your eyes. And so um, this is my senior year in college. And so I took his advice and, and, uh, and looked out. And he also said, um, if you don't want to be a navigator, because I was in the NAV program, I was going to be a navigator as soon as I was commissioned. I was commissioned in June the 1st, 1964. And I'm talking to him now, late 63, uh, s- still as a senior. And um, he said, uh, Carswell Air Force Base was in Fort Worth, Texas, which is about 20 miles away. It says, go to Carswell, um, get your eyes tested. If it's still 2025, 20, 2030, 20, uh, the, the reason for going to Carswell would be for going on active duty. As I was commissioned a second lieutenant in 64, but I was in the reserve while I went to graduate school. And this was a Colonel Darian's suggestion that I go to graduate school. If I had passed my eye test, I would have never gone to graduate school because I, I, I wanted to be an Air Force pilot so bad. So I did that. And I took the eye test about six times during my, uh, uh, during my graduate school. And the sixth time, I passed the test. Now, the reason I passed the test is I went to an ophthalmologist in my hometown of Denison, um, Dr. Levinson wonderful guy, and he outfitted me with hard contact lenses. And hard contact lenses reshaped the cornea of my eye just enough to pass. Well, actually more than that, because if I, when, they, when I put my uh, hard contact lenses on, took them out, 12 hours later, I could see 2015. Really? Yes. So I, I discovered that my second year in graduate school, that this, this phenomenon happened. And so the sixth time that I uh, went to Carswell to take an eye test, they first, and, and, and it was always under the guise of going on active duty. Uh, when you're in the reserve and you want to go on active duty, you take a, the first thing you do is take a physical, and it's called an entry into active duty physical or something like that. So, um, unfortunately, they took my blood pressure before they took my eye test, and I flunked a blood pressure test. Seriously. <laughs> and so then I, the next thing I do is I took the eye test, I passed this, and now I can't go in because of the blood pressure. So I went back to the doctor and you know, pleaded with him. Now that I've passed the uh, eye test, I felt pretty good. He said, okay, go lie down for a while, lie down for a while. And that was below 140 over 90. But it was like 150 over 100 or something like that. First time. So that's... Uh, that's a story. So as soon as I got uh, the okay, and I, I applied to go on active duty, and fortunately, I was uh, at the end of my uh, my master's degree, so I was able to get a master's degree and then go on active duty. But I was two years later going on active duty than I really wanted to be at the time. 
this would have been around about the time then things were heating up in Southeast Asia. Uh, d- did you have a, a, a view as to whether you wanted to be part of that conflict, if you wanted to go and fly combat? Did you know what, what you wanted to fly? No, it wasn't my desire to fly combat. But uh, anytime you join the military, of course, you, that's the uh, that's why you're in the military. So um, I, I went uh, I went to pilot training, uh, which I consider the best best year of my life uh, professionally. Uh, having my children born was, was, was pretty special too. But um, that year was the most exciting year of my life because it was everything I wanted to do. Everything was new. Everything was exciting. Um, I like the camaraderie. I like the military. I like the, the mission, the discipline. There wasn't anything about pilot training I didn't like, and uh, I, I just, I just loved it. So that that was really great. And of course, I went to pilot training. As started in um, December of '66, and uh, Vietnam was was was, uh, was uh, past the Gulf of Tonkin, so Vietnam was, was heating up. But I figured. There's no way that this conflict could last more than a year, so I, I wasn't going to go in anyway. You know, and most everybody felt the same way that how how could the United States of America be stymied by North Vietnam for more than a year? For heaven's sakes! So that that was our attitude. Of course, I didn't that didn't come to pass. But um, in pilot training, um, we did. Uh, fly our missions and pilot training and, and always combat was always part of the uh, scenario. For instance, uh, I remember one time when we were practicing rejoins and lead was right in the sun. So it was, it was, uh, it was tough to find lead and to, and to do a proper rejoin at T-38. And my instructor, the very typical comment said, well, the sun shines in Vietnam. And so you better, better know how to do this. Did you know what what you wanted to fly then? Did you know fast jets, um, recce platforms? What what, what were your? Uh, my, my goal seriously was to fly as much as I could, as many different airplanes as I could. Um, I started out in a KC one thirty five, uh, which was fine. I, I asked uh, uh, for asking my what I my request in order. I wanted to be a T thirty eight instructor pilot when I. When I graduated, we called it FAPE, uh, first assignment uh, IP, and uh, they uh, didn't even have one of those um, available when I when I graduated. And the next, I thought, well, F one hundred five, and I uh, I'm glad I didn't get that because I, I was not not really qualified. Now that we had four people who four guys who did get one hundred fives, and they all they all did well. And looking back, it's kind of amazing because the 105 is is a uh, much more difficult airplane to fly than, than the T-38. And also they lost about half of them in Vietnam. It's really, really bad. Um, so uh, KC-135, and uh, KC-135, was uh, I was kind of hedging my bets. I, uh, I, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't even in the top 10%. I was about in the middle of the class. And um, KC-135, we affectionately uh, called it the T-707. So there was, a, if I got a ty- type rating of 707, then at least I had an, uh, had another option if the Air Force didn't work out for some reason. So for anybody who's not familiar, then that's you saying you could go to the airlines because uh, the 707 was a an airliner originally. What was, you, you know, w- w- was there any sense of disappointment in that then? Um, no, no. I had, and it's a good thing. I, I, I learned a lot being a co-pilot in the KC-135. I had a wonderful aircraft commander. He was a captain, um, young guy. At the time, I didn't think he was a young guy, but he was. And, and uh, he, was, uh, he was gung-ho. He was uh, all uh, mission. And he, he taught me that. And when we went to uh, Thailand to support the Vietnam War, uh, we went over in 1968. I, I got to my base in 67, uh, April of 67, and then uh, was uh, over in uh, 
uh, supporting the Vietnam War the next next year, early next year. He would uh, volunteer. Now, of course, it's a, he's got the aircraft commander, co-pilot, navigator, and boom operator. There's the four of us. And we uh, stayed in the same uh, uh, trailer, and we ate and slept and all, all together. It was always together. And, of course, the aircraft commander was the was the boss and the leader. And um, he, he never asked us our opinion about when we fly or anything. He would come in, and he would volunteer. And sometimes we flew three times a day. And these, these flights are exhausting they really are you take off over grossed always with water injection um, while i was there i uh, i didn't see the crash but there was an, a, a fully loaded uh, kc-135 that crashed off the end of the runway and uh, we when we took off we had to fly through their smoke um, it was uh this is in 68 and you look it up in the online you could you could see the, the direction of it but it was they, uh, what happened is they blew a tire on takeoff, and the tire damaged one engine, and that's all it took to, to keep you from taking off. Uh, in, in peacetime, uh, non-war, uh, we always took off with a margin of safety that we didn't uh, have in Vietnam. So every takeoff was a, was was critical, and then we because we take off fully loaded, in fact sometimes overloaded, uh, to go out to um, just. Um, on the Laotian border and orbit there and the anchors were always uh, peach anchor, uh, cherry anchor, things like that. They were fruits. <laughs> and so they would take, we would take them an orbit and an anchor and just refuel anybody who came up there and wanted fuel and do that for four, about three hours or so. And then we are out of fuel and go back and do it again. But anyway, he would, he would volunteer for us to do like three hours. And I, I'm thinking to myself at the time being a, a uh, young, uh, naive uh, first lieutenant. Gosh, does he really have to do this? I mean, golly, this is, we're, we're really working. I'd kind of like to go to the bar and have a, you know, relax a little bit. Uh, but he, he was he was that way. And uh, I, I learned a lot from him. I appreciate it. So was there a part of, a, a part of you when you're, when you're in, you know, when you're on these refueling tracks and you're looking at these thuds sort of you know, taking gas and then going off up north? or whatever it is they're doing. Was there a part of you that thought, I'd like to be in on that? That I wanted to be in the fighter? Uh, well, yes and no. Uh, I, it, it, it didn't worry me that I wasn't in it. And also, we uh, could hear, we had our, of course, we had all of our radios on, on the guard channel, which is the emergency channel. And um, we, we heard more than once uh, and a pilot uh, scream that you know had been hit, and, uh, and that uh, you know that kind of took any any fun out of combat. That, that I would ever think there was no fun in combat. For me, what was the what was the KC one three five um, or the, the tracks that you were flying? Were, were you sort of safe from any um, you know MIG activity? Were there any because it's a high value asset uh, a, a tanker and i guess from a propaganda point of view going and shooting down a tanker would be a pretty good thing for the north vietnamese to have done was, was it ever a possibility as a was there a threat in that sense well there's always a threat of course but the the um, our orbits our orbits our our holding patterns were designed so that if everything works well the ground radar which is uh, you know monitoring everybody all the time uh, more than once we have been called to, to fly south to go, to go down from our anchor. So if, if they saw a MiG coming within a threat, and I don't know how many miles that was, say 50 miles or so, then uh, we would be directed to, to leave and, and go south. And then when the threat was over, we'd go back to where we were. But in any case, we would uh, the, um, the controllers would always know where we were. So uh, they could direct uh, any fighters to us. Do you know how many how many um, sorties or how many missions you flew in the KC one three five from from Thailand? No, I. Um, you, you were there for what a year? No, that was um, that was uh, six weeks or two months at a time. Oh. I did it twice in the sixty eight and sixty nine, and then I left in sixty nine to uh, to uh, fly the C one thirty. 
and then I was over there for a year. Okay. So and what was your what was your Hercules tour like then? Um, well, it um, C one thirty. It's <laughs> I I like flying, but the C one thirty was my least favorite airplane. It had uh, it had a lot of systems that I that first of all it's fully hydraulic. It's fully it was hydraulic uh, flight controls with a manual backup, but the manual backup required at least two strong guys to, to operate it. Um, the mission I flew, we flew the um, Air, Air, Airborne Command and Control Center is what, what I flew. So uh, we didn't have a, a specified orbit. We had a, an area that we flew in. And wherever the uh, air war was, where we were close enough to be in radio contact, we flew, um, we had a, what they call a capsule. It was a, looked like a big camper, a big uh, aluminum camper that had uh, all sorts of fancy radios and everything in it. The airplane I flew, uh, let's see if I had a picture of it. I don't have a picture of it right here, but it, uh, it bristled with antennas. Uh, we had Intel people and uh, command and control. We had, of course, HF, VHF radios, all sorts of stuff. And uh, the stuff in the back, I, my, my philosophy in the Air Force was anything that's classified that I don't have a need to know, I don't want to know. So we were allowed to go back into the capsule uh, when we had our break during the flight uh, to eat lunch or something. But um, I never asked any questions about how they were doing it. But of course, I could see maps and everything. And then when we were in the cockpit, we would know what frequency they were on. Uh, directing the air war, and so we would listen on that. And uh, so I, I and, he, and we flew at night. I was in uh, Alley Cat. We had Alley Cat and uh, Hillsboro, Moonbeam, and Cricket were the four command and control uh, airplanes. Two of them were airborne 24 hours. Uh, our flights were about 12 and a half hours each. We uh, would usually carry three pilots, but sometimes two. And uh, that, that was our, our mission. And we, we would hear the air war, so we could hear the fighters and the facts and everything. So I, I had a pretty good notion of everything that was going on. Uh, again, you heard a lot of emergency calls and calls that uh, I, I wish I hadn't heard. So, so were these, these people and this, this equipment on the airplane, they were relaying to a ground station or there were decisions being made in the air in your airplane about what should happen next and who should do what? Yes. yes. The, uh, and I don't really know how all that works, the uh, fighters and everything, but when they hit a target, uh, if they if the target was um, was under uh, weather or something or they couldn't hit it, then they would they would come to the airplane and call up the airplane for, for direction. And then the, the, uh, the boss was called the director, DABS, D-A-B-S, director of the air battle staff. I think. And uh, he was in charge of the air war during his time. Now, he had a boss in Saigon, but uh, real-time decisions were made by him. Sometimes it was a general, but usually a, a full colonel. Right. So you're in, your, you're in your second operational type. What are you eyeing up next, then, if, you, if your ambition is to fly uh, lots of different types? What are your thoughts about where your career should go next? I was in uh, kind of a bind because Strategic Air Command was control the KC-135s, um, had a big magnet. <laughs> and uh, then I flew the C-130s, well, Tactical Air Command also flew C-130s. So having been dual qualified in those and, and being, uh, I was a captain by that time, but fairly young captain. Uh, so I was dual qualified in two airplanes in KC-135 and C-130, it would be natural for me to go back to one of those. Uh, when I was in the, the uh, KC-135 at, at Kinchlow Air Force Base in Michigan, it, uh, we would stand alert for a week at a time. And during that time, we, as, a, as a crew, we would, we would be together. Um, after my uh, first uh, aircraft commander, my second aircraft commander was uh, Colonel Feebig, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Feebig. And he'd been around a while, and he was a World War II uh, uh, pilot. And uh, we were talking, of course, and I told him what I wanted to do and everything, and he was very helpful. And he, he said, have, have you ever heard of the special assignment section? No, I hadn't. 
He said, well, in, in every uh, personnel office in the Air Force, um, there's a personnel, there's a, uh, a regulation that describes special assignments. Special assignments are assignments that you don't normally get from the normal pipeline. Um, the military personnel center in uh, San Antonio uh, are the people. They're very powerful people. They they tell, they, they dish out the assignments. He says, well, there are certain assignments that are not dished out by military personnel without an impetus, and the impetus being a, uh, uh, an application and possibly an interview. And I said, oh, that sounds interesting. And it turns out that being a instructor pilot in uh, Air Training Command was one of those. And so he says, I suggest you go and uh, look in the military personnel center. Well, I remembered that when I was in the C-130, so I went to the personnel center there at uh, Udorn, Thailand, where I was based, and read their, their regulation. And at that time, I applied to uh, F-102s, F-106s, um, to be a, um, there, there was even an, an F-86 group uh, that was still in existence, applied for that, and, um, and, a, and a B-57. And the B-57, of course, is a short, uh, uh, the old uh, British Canberra that the uh, Air Force modified. And it, the, the short wing 57 looked like the British Canberra and had a clamshell canopy. And um, so I applied for that and, and I got that. I mean, I was to, kind of to my surprise. But at the same time, because I did not want to go back to C-130s or KC-135s, I put in my uh, request to... Uh, leave the Air Force. <laughs> Unfortunately, my request to leave the Air Force came through before my assignment to the B-57s came through. So then I had to hurry and uh, take that back. And uh, fortunately, during Vietnam, they needed pilots, so I could take it back. So I, I, I kind of lucked out on that one. So I accepted the, the uh, B-57 assignment, and the B-57 assignment was at uh, Albuquerque in Kirtland Air Force Base. And there was a, a group there, the RB-57F, that uh, was also there. And so um, after I checked out in the short wing 57, I, I then uh, asked for and was uh, accepted into the RB-57F program. And so now, now I'm, I'm a fairly young guy with four airplanes under my belt and a master's degree. And so I, I flew the uh, RB-57F for a couple of years. Um, and then uh, applied to the test pilot school and was accepted. Uh, had to go to the test pilot school for a five flight evaluation. They they uh, they were really uh, picky there at, at Edwards, and so I had to go there and fly the T thirty eight five times with an instructor, several instructors, and the commandant of all things. And uh, if I passed that, then uh, then they accepted me. Well, I. Of course, they don't tell you whether you're passing or not. You just do everything, say, well, thank you. And then I got notice that I, I was selected for the test pilot school. That's how I got to the test pilot school. Let's go back then to Canberra's and B-57s and RB-57s. The, the, the Canberra, at least, you know, has flown by the Royal Air Force and the Royal Australian Air Force and, you know, had, had a bit of a reputation um, for... Uh, you know asymmetric thrust if you if you lost an engine could be a real handful on landing or if you lost the engine on takeoff um same issues for the rb57 or, or b57 Absolutely. Right. Yeah. What, what what was the approach to that did you actually practice because i think one of the problems the raf had was that they would practice in single engine um landings and they would have fatalities just practicing yes yes uh one of my best friends was killed in the b57 um he, he and I flew C-130s together at, at uh, Udorn. In fact, we, we applied for the B-57 program at the same time. And uh, we both came out there, and uh, Dale Mann was his name. He's a wonderful guy. And after I went to the test pilot school, about three or four months later, he, he was killed doing exactly that, doing an engine-out approach. And what you had to do, and what my instructor told me in the 57, is you have to 
you have to keep the airspeed up. And um, it, it's more important to keep the airspeed up than it is to keep the airplane um, flying straight. Which you, you could fly with a crab with the, with the speed up, and that's better than flying uh, co- uh, straight, the, you know, the, the fuselage straight, kicking the rudder, um, if you lose speed. As if you lose speed, it's, it's, it's downhill real quick. It took 100, I remember this, 165 pounds of rudder force to fly the airplane straight. Well, that's, that's very hard to do. <laughs> and, then, and it hurts. It hurts to do that. So the idea that for me was to not fly the 165 pounds until, I, until I'm on final mm. and, uh, and, and keep about 30 or 40 knots above approach speed because it's not hard to lose speed um, when you have flaps down, uh, and I forgot what the flap setting was for a single engine landing, but I think it was less than full flaps. So you come down with uh, less than full flaps, uh, hot, and um, then straighten it out. And then uh, the way that my instructor described it, which the way I remember it was you paint the airplane on the runway, come down and just fly it on. You don't try to take the power off and drop it in, but you just come in and, 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 and aim for that two or three feet above the runway. And then you can, you can take the power off. Oh, it, it was tough. And it was, and they, at uh, test pilot school, they were flying the B-57 uh, before I got there and they discontinued the B-57 program uh, at the test pilot school when one of the students uh, was killed. Doing that. So yeah, that, that was a very bad aspect of the B-57. Didn't have enough tails with the nose. That wasn't happening. Well, I mean, just generally, then, as a, from a pilot's point of view, you're, you know, you come from flying big aeroplanes, very big in the case of the KC one three five, I suppose, and uh, now you're flying a smaller aeroplane. Um, you know, you've got a, is it a nav that you'd have in the back of a of a B fifty seven? Yeah. Uh, so, so you're the only pilot flying the aeroplane. Um, is it a more dynamic experience? Did it uh, expand your skill set as a pilot? Did it challenge you? Oh, yes, 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 yes. All of that did. Yeah, it, it was. Yeah, the, 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 uh, those airplanes are completely different in their flying qualities. All, all, all four of them. And, and the mission of that airplane was it was just a, a, a tactical bomber for the, for the B-57? I flew the RB. Well, it was, it was the B-57. Um, the uh, mission of the long wing, which was really the, the, the reason why the short wing was there, uh, the, the short wing, we would do air sampling. Uh, this was just starting to be sensitive about in the environment. So uh, I remember one time uh, in the short wing 57, I'd sampled uh, the plume of smokestacks from a concrete, I think it was, out in New Mexico. And what they had me do was fly through this plume. Well, I couldn't. Well, I did that. You know, the the, uh, the concrete plant is, you know, maybe ten miles away, and and uh, the uh, the smoke, uh, the wind would cause the smoke to be. It, it, it would look like a tunnel when I got there. So I I flew into the smoke. Now I can't see where I'm going. I know if I'm in the smoke, I'm I'm okay because if I drop below the smoke, there's still lots of, lots of, lots of uh, altitude. But I wasn't sure where that smokestack was. <laughs> so I, I knocked it off early, but it was things like that. And uh, it was, it was a different type of assignment that I, you know, that I, that I hadn't even contemplated. You know, who ever thought about flying through the smokestack of a concrete plant as being an Air Force mission? That, that RB-57 still flies today and NASA, I think, operate four of them. Uh, well, no, the long wing. The, the long, long wing. Okay. So that's the F model. The, it was uh, the F F model. Um, it was RB when I was flew it, and then later, um, when they try when uh, the political forces or the Air Force wanted to close down the squadron, they changed it to WB, uh, and we were under the Air Weather Service, and they thought maybe that would that would save the military uh, mission for the. Uh, RB. Well, it didn't. It's, but NASA then, and we, we, we flew NASA's mission when, when, when I flew it. I, I was uh, the TDY to Ellington 
couple of times and flew their Earth Resources mission. So the uh, the military would be uh, bailed out to NASA uh, sometimes. Very nice people at, at NASA, and this was during the uh, moon launch and everything. So it, it was fun to uh, to go there and uh, and uh, since I was interested in in uh, being an astronaut and being a test pilot and everything, I, I maybe made myself a, a pest by hanging around the uh, aircraft operations people. Met some astronauts there, and it was just uh, just a, a thrill for me to do that. But our primary mission was to sample nuclear fallout from nuclear tests. Well, the nuclear test ban treaty stopped most of that, so we didn't really have a firm mission. But we did do some uh, some some nuclear sampling, and there was an elaborate procedure about what we had to do to do that. Uh, we would fly up around seventy thousand feet, a little bit lower. We, we couldn't. 70 was really, really putting it out, but we could carry 10,000 pounds of equipment up certainly above 65,000 and um, and do some sampling. And, and if, if we had a, a hot area, and the guy in the back would tell me if we had a hot area, then I would have to depressurize the airplane, and it would depressurize slowly. But that kept the radioactive particulates, supposedly, from entering the cockpit, so it would be a slow... And we were wearing pressure suits, too, with a dosimeter, uh, a, a device that read how much uh, radiation we were, we were getting. We never got much. So that was our mission. And we also did Earth Resources. And uh, there was one time that we were um, hired by the by university to look for uh, old Indian trails. Mm. It could be seen from 60,000 feet as a contrast. And we did all sorts of, of missions like that. Uh, one was a laser mission. It was a classified thing, and I, I didn't know what they were doing, but we, I had to... <laughs> it was funny. They, all of the, the pilots who were going to fly the laser missions had to have their uh, uh, retinas uh, examined. So if we t- they took pictures of retinas, and I asked the question at the time, well, are they expecting something to change in these retinas <laughs> due to this laser thing? So we would fly over a range, and at the time, then we were we were supposed to uh, we wore goggles and, and close our eyes. So I don't know what the heck they were doing. Now. <laughs> Sounds like something out of the X Files. Was that uh, the the nuclear sampling mission? Was it particularly sensitive? Uh, you know, there, there's still uh, you know there's still some questions as to what NASA are doing with those B fifty seven those WB fifty sevens today. And, you know, there's some there's obviously some kind of classified component to it. But was going round and flying that mission particularly sensitive at the time? No, I don't think so. I I, I didn't get into you know what the reasons for the missions are and everything. I, I was really primarily or completely interested in just. Um, what do I do? You know, what, what profiles do I do? What switches do I throw? And where do I go? There was one time that I was, um, I flew over Oklahoma at night and photographed the tops of thunderstorms. That was enough. Now, I don't know who asked for that, but that's uh, we did. And that was interesting because I was up at 65,000 feet. Well, the thunderstorm was at 60,000 feet. It was really, really high up there. And, uh, course the thought comes in <laughs> what if i lose an engine because <laughs> the thun- it was thunderstorm as far as i could see and uh, they wanted pictures of that thunderstorm so that's exactly what, the, what they got the other uh, probably one of the more dangerous missions i've ever flown uh, was uh, in the rb 57 f and that was um out of oh three times a year we would sample the air, essentially not from the North Pole, but slightly south of the North Pole and slightly north of the South Pole. We operated out of Ileson, uh, Alaska, Albuquerque, um, St. Anderson in, uh, the, in Panama, and then Argentina. So all of those bases, we would, uh, we would be, go TDY, and I went, I went TDY to all of them, and uh, we would... Uh, fly air sampling missions and this was for i think for the atomic energy commission uh, i say one of the most dangerous missions was uh, i was in Ileson in uh, fairbanks alaska in february 
the outside air temperature was minus 60 degrees. It was cold, and I, I've never been anything like that before. Uh, it was so cold that you had, if you walked across the street, you had to bundle up and put something over your uh, face and everything, or, or you, your flesh would freeze. Um, and I, and I, so <laughs> our mission was to take off from Ileson. We were about six hour mission. Uh, fly north for three hours, turn around and fly south for three hours in pitch dark the whole time. And uh, that, that was the only flight that I flew in a ejection seat airplane that I disarmed the ejection seat because there was no way I wanted to eject. There was no scenario by which I would eject because you eject or dead. So, um, I didn't want the thing going off by itself on purpose or on by accident. But that, 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 was, uh, that was tense. What was this your first? You talked about a pressure suit. And for anybody who's not familiar, that's, like, that's a bit like a spacesuit, right? There's a helmet, there's a, a gilet or whatever it's called. You know, you're sort of fully encapsulated in, in a piece of clothing. Was that your first experience of really high altitude flight then? How did you get on with the sensation of being trussed up and wearing a, a, a effectively a spacesuit. I loved it. That, that, that was easy. No, they put me in a, that spacesuit. I, man, this is great. I, that's feel great, you know, and I'm going to go up to above 60,000 feet. It's, uh, the world really looks different up there. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a wonderful experience. I loved every second of it. Uh, the, the pressure suit is, is cumbersome. It's, um, you have, uh, very thick garden gloves. I was calling garden gloves. So it makes tacti tactical feel very difficult. You know, picking up a dime would be kind of difficult. Um, and the mobility in the cockpit is somewhat uh, constrained. So things that might drop on the floor, uh, usually we put a lanyard around it, like a grease pencil or a pen or something like that. Uh, Velcro was used. Uh, our checklist was Velcro to our uh, leg. In the SR-71, we had a mission checklist and an airplane checklist, and, and uh, they, they were on two different legs and Velcro, and, and, and it just didn't have a lot of a lot of freedom of movement. But you don't really need it if the airplane's designed for that, and the RB-57 was. So everything you needed was right here. In the case of a uh, depressurization, then the, the suit would have filled with air. You would have been then in, effectively in your own little environment. Uh, does that mean then that the sort of arms go rigid? And can you, can you I mean, what, what, what can you do when, if you get a depressurization? Do, do, can you still control the airplane effectively or is it a struggle? Um, a struggle, but you can control the airplane. Now, it, the pressure suit is not a mission completion suit necessarily, but a get me down suit. Uh, the air, it's, it's not that there's air injected into the suit if you lose pressurization, it's that the air that is in the suit is captured. So um, the, the, the suit is free to, free to breathe, if you will. When you breathe in, you, uh, the, the way the, the helmet works is the visor is uh, it's like this and you have a seal around your face so that only the face area is injected with 100% oxygen, and it's on a, a, a diluter demand system. So, if you if you breathe in, the oxygen comes in. When you breathe out, then it stops. So it, it requires a um, a negative pressure for the, for the valve to open, and then the air that you breathe out is then vented into the suit down below the suit. So again, with the valve. So uh, when you're breathing, you're always pumping air into the suit, 100% oxygen. And if you lost pressurization real quick, and the worst, of course, is a rapid instantaneous depressurization, then the air that's in the suit is trapped because the, the suit, the, the uh, valve, which allows air out of the suit, is closed immediately. And it's got to close, you know, right now. You can't close a second later. It's got to be done right now. And and, it, and that's one of the things that they, they check very religiously. They put it up in a, in a pressure chamber on the ground and, and check those things. 
and that valve just closes by pressure differential. That's that's it. There's nothing mechanical. And then once once the the uh, the pressure cessation has occurred, then you you refill the suit with this with this. Uh, every time you breathe, you add you add air to the suit. Mm. And you can dial the pilot can dial in the rigidity. Now, if you if you if you have no outside air pressure, which you don't have essentially at 65,000, 70,000 feet, uh, then uh, the suit will not allow you to depressurize itself. And you could try to depressurize; it's not going to do it. But um, you can uh, you can pressurize it more if you want by turning another valve. So it's um, I don't know that I've ever heard of the, of the full pressure suit ever malfunctioning. So that uh, there, there was an incident in uh, at, at Edwards where a, a man was killed, unfortunately, but it, it was that his glove wasn't wasn't fitted properly, and when he had the depressurization, the glove came free, and that that let all the air out, and he was killed because of that. But that's. That wasn't a suit malfunction, except for the just a uh, didn't have the, the glove. If your suit, uh, I had had one time. I had the suit inflate uh, when I was at, you know trying to refuel in the tanker. So my suit starts flying. Well, so I disconnected from the tanker, came back, and now I'm you know how the heck do I depressurize this thing? So I did everything I could. I radioed back to the uh, to the uh, to the command post there and and uh, got the experts on and. I tried everything they said, and it didn't work. So I had to had to abort the mission. And uh, the way that I deflated the suit was just open the open the glove, and the suit's fine. Yeah. Now you ask about the rigidity. The, the rigidity is um, you've seen the uh, the Michelin Man. That's the kind of the way you feel like this. And it takes some effort to to, to move, but it is movable. They have a the, the suit is fixed with uh, what we call slits or uh, some sort of design that allows you to move. Okay. Um, the tactical feel is, is completely gone because now you've got you got your glove. Like I've got a glove over here. To the second question. Anyway, this is a pressure suit glove, and uh, the uh, material here allows you to to pick things up. It's a kind of a sticky material. And then you see over here are the little slits that, that allow you to move your fingers. But it is difficult. It would be a good exercise to get this thing inflated and go like this. It's a good way to strengthen it. Then you have these uh, straps on the back that you can keep the thing down. Otherwise, it might move down like that. I, I, I mean, this again might sound like an odd question, but it's the kind of thing I wonder. So I'll ask. Um, have you, at this point, then in your flying career, had any negative experiences? Has anything happened to you that's made you question whether this is safe, whether this is something you want to carry on doing? Has anything uh, changed in your um, outlook at, towards flying? I mean, I, I've had friends killed, and I've had acquaintances, and I, I, I saw a crash one time. That was uh, the chief of fighters at Edwards, uh, my club. Wonderful man, wonderful guy, and I, I actually saw him crash. And, and he was killed. Uh, you know, that's that's very bad. And it, uh, I don't like it. I cried. It, it's uh, it's really it's a it's a traumatic uh, event. But um, the thing I don't know. It, as a military pilot, the the mission is so instilled that. It did not occur to me that to quit flying because of that. It just perhaps um, caused me to be safer to, to think about it more. I, I didn't, believe me, I, I when I the biggest thing that that I wanted to be as a pilot, was, I, I wanted to know as much as I could about the airplane. It's certainly how to operate it, the flight manual. I read the flight manual. I, I, I read it again, and, and I, I never stopped reading the flight manual. Just pick up and, and read the hydraulic system or read the electrical system or something like that. Uh, look at the, the emergency procedures. Uh, we all had emergency procedures we had to memorize, and, 
we could be tested on it at a moment's notice. And if we failed emergency procedures test, then uh, that uh, that went to the wing commander, and that was not a, not a pleasant experience. I did it one time. I put uh, battery switch off when I meant to say fuel off. It was the far uh, fuel, the far uh, engine fire. Fire control handle pull, uh, fuel off. Fire handle control battery off. <laughs> well, the wing commander understood that that was a stupid thing, and so I learned, you know, read your answers again and again and again. So that's the only time I flunked emergency procedures test. But oh, in pilot training, they started that early. You know, that would be at the beginning of the day. They would say, uh, "Okay, uh, Lieutenant Smith, and Lieutenant Smith, would stand up at attention. Give me the emergency procedure for engine failure on takeoff." And you better tell it to you, and you better tell it to you right, and da 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 da. <laughs> and uh, it, it, it's, it's like learning the lines of a play, except you got to know what to do with it. Uh, my approach to emergency procedures was always know the first, know the symptoms, then know the first pilot reaction that you have to do without reference to the checklist, and then have a notion of what comes next. So that if the like if you're flying with a navigator and, the, and traditionally the navigator reads a checklist while the pilot's flying, especially in the one pilot airplane, uh, then I, I should realize if the if the navigator makes a mistake. So that that's that's the type that's my approach to it. That, that was I suppose one of the things I was wondering um, when you talk about having to learn these things, and it's a bit like learning the lines of a play. When you get, and we'll talk about the SR seventy one in time, um, so don't feel like you have to really sort of expand too much. But when you get to something like the SR seventy one, which strikes me as being very complex, um, does that challenge increase? I mean, is you know, or, or do the training aids get better? Does um, access to simulators improve because you're flying a more complex aeroplane? What, what's the sure. <laughs> uh... Oh, this is uh, this is two thirds of the SR seventy one flight manual. The other third is um, the uh, performance data. But this is, I mean, this is that's a lot of stuff. And, uh, that's that's it is the most complicated airplane probably the Air Force has ever had or ever will have, because it was before the days of computers and and um, and displays that were automatic and that so uh, it was a what they call a round dial uh, steam gauge airplane um i've got a picture of the cockpit if you want to see that <laughs> okay just a second. oh i had this framed cool yeah that's very cool just because I, I, I wanted to be reminded of, you know, of what my office looked like. And uh, that, that cockpit was, was just so familiar to me uh, by the time I finished flying the airplane. The training for the SR-71 was, was, uh, was unique in the Air Force. Um, it took the longest. It had the most complicated airplane. And... It flew in the in the worst environment that an airplane can fly in. Really, worst environment. I mean, the outside air temperature was well. The the skin temperature of the airplane, the, the average was 620 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, 620 degrees Fahrenheit is uh, is a little bit hotter than your oven on the cleaning cycle. So, I mean, that's that's what the what the window was right in front of my face. That's that's pretty bad. The outside air pressure was around one quarter of one pound per square inch. Uh, down at sea level, it's fifteen point eight or so, uh, fourteen point eight, around fifteen psi. There's a big difference. And then you're going uh, speed, and you've got uh, shock waves uh, all over the airplane. No telling what's going on out there. The dynamic pressure is is fairly high, uh, about three hundred and fifty knots or so. So yeah, it's the most uh, complicated. Now, as far as the Air Force is concerned, the SR-71 
had a, uh, there, were, there were no Air Force people killed in the SR-71. We had accidents, we lost airplanes, but, but no one died. And uh, that's, that's, you can't say that for too many military airplanes. Now, why that was is because our training was so intensive. Um, I tell you a, a short story about when I was first introduced to this. I was a test pilot at Edwards, and I, of course, I applied for the SR, and um, and I finally got the, the, the call that I, I was accepted, and they told me who my sponsor was. My sponsor was Tom Allison, who I found out later that he and I were born one day apart. So we were contemporaries. And uh, but Tom had been flying. He was an instructor pilot in the SR, you know, and I'd lost the two years when I went to graduate school. So uh, he had uh, about a two year jump on me. And um, I was very enthusiastic about, I mean, this was the ultimate airplane, of course. And so I called him and uh, I talked to him. He, he called me and he's very nice. The, the, in the Air Force, the sponsor is supposed to take the new guy under his wing and show him around and make sure he has the right flight manuals and, and uh, know where everything is and, and do any kind of odd job that, uh, that needs to be done. Well, <laughs> since he was my sponsor, I, I said, uh, one of the things says, well, well, Tom, when can, I, when, when can I fly the airplane? And his answer was very direct and um, it kind of gave me the idea of what um, what to expect. He said he said exactly like this. He says, "Look, pal, you'll fly that airplane when you're ready." <laughs> well, okay. Now I know. Now I'm getting the idea of what's going on, and that's exactly the attitude that they have: is you'll fly that airplane when you're ready, and if you're not ready on time, you're not going to fly the airplane. Really? Yeah. So it. Uh, the uh, training mission, uh, the training, I, I'm one of the few pilots who I enjoyed the simulators. I enjoyed the simulators very much. I, it was a challenge, but I enjoyed it because it was, it was honing all of these uh, procedures that, uh, you know, you, you've got to know. So, so tell us about then your experience with the uh, test pilot school at Edwards. Well, the test pilot school was, um, first of all, it was this, this five flight of Al was, was uh, something else. I didn't have it. I've been experienced to that. Uh, I'll tell you something kind of funny that uh, we we did this in pairs. I didn't I wasn't I didn't know that at the time, but I came out to Edwards by myself. I was from from Albuquerque, and the first night I went to the officers' club to have dinner, and I, I'm there by myself. I don't know anybody here, and I see this guy uh, over a couple of tables off. He's also dining by himself. He's got a flight suit on, so I'm thinking maybe this is the guy that I'm going to come out with me. So I, I walk over and introduce myself and uh, say, I'm here for the five flight of value. And he says, yes, I am too. His name is Pete Hartwick. And uh, we sat down and talked, and I told him, I says, Pete, I, I haven't flown a T-38 you know, in a while. And I'm supposed to, uh, to, get, to uh, fly it well, and I want to fly it well. I'm kind of concerned about that. What do you think? Well, <laughs> Pete says, well, uh, I'm a T-38 instructor, and um, I flew uh, my own T-38 down here, and it's parked out on base hops. <laughs> so I thought, now, if we are in competition, I am in trouble. <laughs> it's this guy. So instead, instead of uh, worrying about it, I said, well, can, can you tell me a few pointers, you know? It says, I haven't done a closed pattern, and... Uh, T-38 in a long time. Can you walk me through that as an instructor? And, oh, yeah. It says, uh, you know, speed and everything. It says, when you, when you, when you turn uh, to downwind, you want to put your heels on the horizon. Start with, I forgot the speed, but you're 300 knots or so. Put your uh, heels on the horizon, a 45-degree bank turn, and pull. And then when you're um, 400 feet from the Track around altitude, relax a stick, roll out, put the mag compass on the horizon, come back to 80%, <laughs> fly it down. When the runway is over your over your rank, <laughs> gear down, uh, flap 60, go into a turn uh, at, one, at 175, stop the stop the decreases, 
this much throttle. They talked me through it. It was right. He was he was absolutely correct. <laughs> so felt really good about that. We flew formation together in this thing. We it was a dual thing. We went out and did it together. Then we got together and we flew formation together. And uh, Pete was great. Pete was in our it's, it's in my class. He was the only guy in the class that didn't have a master's degree, and he was the smartest guy in class. Right. <laughs> yeah. Wonderful guy. I still talk to him. He's he's, he's great. So you weren't sort of really competing with him, or if you were, you both ended up getting slots. Well, I wasn't competing with him. I was. Uh, what they did is they they called out the people that they thought would uh, would be okay, mm. and I I was um, my uh, background is attractive in that I had a good flying background, good physical, and so I had lots of airplanes and lots of experience, and I was still a captain and all that. So uh, they that's why they picked me and. Um, then the um, the five flight of was just to make sure that I had the right attitude. I guess uh, the right attitude was something like this. I the first time I got in, I had an instructor pilot, uh, Rotten Ralph Cunningham. This was, was his name. <laughs> I didn't call him Rotten Ralph, but uh, he was a major, Major Cunningham, sir. And um, when I got in, I, I did what I did in the uh, fifty seven. You know, I started reading the checklist to to him. You know. And uh, I got about three or four steps into the checklist. He says, you don't read the checklist to me. You perform the items. I'll know if the items are not performed properly. <laughs> and we go fly. And that was the attitude of Denver. So, okay. So, and then we do the checklist and it worked out okay. What was, what was happening at Edwards then at that time? Um, so this would have been early 70s? Uh, 73. 73. Yeah. Okay. So what, what, what was, you know, what was new? What was exciting at Edwards? What, what were you hoping well, the, to be part of? The A-10 and the lightweight fighter and uh, the uh, later they had the, the B-1. Um, and they had uh, the uh, fly-off between the cargo planes. Uh, Boeing was one with the twin engine, the high, high wing with uh, the air blowing over the wing. It did not get it. And I, you know, I'd, I'm not really sure what the C-17. I'm not sure what the uh, yeah. designation. Yeah, I, I think uh, C was it C-15 because uh, it's it's still at the boneyard, isn't it? It's still at AMARC at, at Davis Monthan. I'm not sure what they were called, but they they had lots of different airplanes. The, the uh, lightweight fighter and the, the A-10 had a fly off too, between. Uh, well, the one was uh, the one that did not get it had. Why uh, Why nine? The YA nine. That's right. Yeah, it was a Northrop airplane. Yeah, and it was an airplane that uh, that could actually fly like this, mm. go like this, but it could it could translate left and right, which the A ten I guess couldn't, but the A ten made up for it and other other things. So we had that, there was lots going on. It, it was um, I like to say that it you, you had to almost sword fight to get into the into the traffic pattern because it it was it was full. The U2, of course, was there. And, uh, and, uh, I got to fly that, too. So. Was there anything then in particular that you wanted to do? I mean, you've, you've already said you want to fly as many different types as you want, but are you, again, are you sort of eyeing up any of these programs and thinking that's where I'm, I'd like to set my sights? Is it is it possible for you as a uh, somebody going through the test pilot school to decide what it is that you end up doing, or are you assigned it? How does How does it work? Well, ultimately, you assign that, but you can put in your, your request. You always do that. There's a space on your, um, I forgot what it's called, but the thing that the uh, commanders read, you know, your, your dream list, your wish list. And so uh, the idea was to keep that up, up to date. Um, I would have done anything that they asked me to do. They had the X-24 going on at the time, and that, that, that looked like a good program, but Dick Scobie got that one. Mm -hmm. Dick Dick was uh, in the class before me. We shared an office for three years. Dick and I did, and and uh, when I, I applied for the for the uh, astronaut program, uh, Dick and myself and uh, uh, Tom Meshko were the three that uh, the, the three that I knew that were that were the way we. If you're in the Air Force, you have to apply to the Air Force. Air Force has to nominate you to NASA, and then NASA makes the. Uh, the final determination of the three of us and the people that I knew. And um, Dick Scobie was by far the best. I've ever 
for them. But I, I, I always say that uh, if I were on the board, I would certainly choose Dick over me. Dick was a lot more serious than I was. I was kind of a fun-loving guy and maybe gave the impression of not being as, as serious as I really was. But, but Dick was all business, but he also had fun, too, uh, in, in his off hours. But he was, uh, I love Dick Scobie. He's wonderful. Something I, I, ironic is when I left the squadron at Edwards to go to the SR-71, Dick uh, wrote a, a note to me and said, uh, think of us low and slow guys when you're out flying your SR-71. And of course, then he, uh, he became an astronaut. Well, let's talk about the astronaut side of things in, in a minute. But if, if we can, just talk about the training then, the experience of going through the test pilot school easy difficult enjoyable not very very difficult and enjoyable the academics um were uh, were difficult i thought because I, I was not an engineer i was a pure math guy and uh, i aced the math portion that, that was okay but the uh, thermal aerodynamics blew my mind and i i mean i learned the midnight oil on, on thermal dynamics the good news is that we really didn't have to be experts in those fields. We, we had to have a working knowledge of that. Uh, stability derivatives, I, I like fine. That was fine. Um, and it made sense to me. Uh, some guys, what's the stability derivative stuff? You know, as an engineer, they may not have had the uh, math training that I've had. So, um, and. <sighs> How to test airplanes and things like that, a very, very unique uh, set of uh, requirements to do that. I don't know that it would be applicable to anything else. Um, we had to learn those. We did lots of reports, written reports and oral reports. They just wanted to condition us to be used to doing that because that's what a test pilot does. The most important important thing that they drummed into us is that test pilots never lie about what they're testing. They're testing. And, uh, I can tell you later in, in my United Airlines experience, that was the first thing that worried me when I took the, te the uh, job to be a test pilot for United Airlines was, are they going to pressure me to pass an airplane that I don't think is, is right? And uh, spoiler alert, they don't. I had the final say on whether an airplane was passenger worthy, and they never questioned me. Mm. I flew the, the U-2 and the T-38 and the, uh, and the KC-135. Uh, my tests in the U-2 were called systems tests, I suppose. We did laser tests, we did uh, trailing wire antenna, uh, camera tests, uh, film, that type of thing. Uh, some of it was not just for the U-2, it was for other systems, and uh, some of it was classified, so I don't really know what what is still classified, so I really can't talk about the specifics, but um, we kept busy. Um, we would make photo runs on particular fields, for instance, where people of some unknown origin would put things out. And I, I knew that they were doing it, but I didn't know what they were or what to look for or anything. I just flew missions across the fields and took pictures. Yeah, that was the classified part, was what they, what they were doing. But obviously, they're testing the, uh, the ability to see things. And I'm glad that they do things like that. Mm. So the, the U2 was a, a multi, uh, multi-discipline uh, test platform. This is a big conversation that I'm not sure we should start right now, but um, so you came from flying a high altitude reconnaissance platform in the form of the, the RB-57. Uh, what was the U-2 like in comparison? Is, it, is there any point in drawing a comparison? Um, you know, they talk about the coffin corner. The, the RB-57F has a, a, a more um, dangerous coffin co corner than the U-2 does. I flew the A, D, C, and F uh, models, so I didn't. I haven't flown the, the, the newer models, the, the ones that are longer and bigger, which are completely different. I understand, but the uh, the A model is the one I checked out in J fifty seven engine that chugged 
Are you familiar with the chug, the bad engine? Well, (laughs) the flight manual says, uh, if you are uh, landing and you want to go around, you're going to touch the ground. If you go around, if you're, uh, I mean, if you're in the flare, you're going to go around because you cob the engine and and, uh, and the engine goes just like a compressor stall. And then about five or six seconds of that chugging and then it catches and, and, and you're off. But uh, you have to be aware that uh, if you have your uh, throttle at idle, you're not going to have any power for the next six seconds, no matter what you do. That was one thing. The... Um, the, the C model is good. Uh, um, it's a J, J-75 engine. I think. Uh, it was a pretty powerful airplane. Now, your question about what the uh, the coffin corner for the A model, anyway, and the C model was, was uh, actually a little benign because the mock, the mock Buffett, it would tuck, but it's easily recoverable. Uh, you also had a device called the Gus system, which would give you a pitch-up moment. Uh, so if you if you got into a tuck and you bring your, your control column back and it doesn't arrest the downward motion, you could hit the Gus switch, and that, that'll do it for you. Mm. It'll give you a pitch-up automatically. Um, so then on the other side, the stall. I've, I've stalled the U-2 on purpose up at uh, 60, 65,000 feet. It's um, it's recoverable. You know? So you got you got a stall, you got the mock tuck, both of them. You can get out of it. The B fifty seven, if you got into mock tuck, um, it would immediately go into flutter, which happened. Uh, my my uh, flight commander, uh, operations officer, was killed in the B fifty seven while I was there. I was on the accident board for it um, because he got into mock tuck. And all that does is he had his, uh, you know, on the 57, if you put your speed brakes out or the gear down, that'll give you a pitch up too. But he had the gear down and the speed brakes up, and then he got into mock tuck, and there wasn't any way to go. The flight manual at the time said, um, try to um, stop the, uh, the mock tuck is it's an oscillation, and uh, the wing flutter starts immediately after the mock tuck. Then the, the flight manual at the time said, try to uh, dampen the wing flutter out. Well, it, it turns out you can't do it. And it was uh, demonstrated by this uh, this uh, action. He and his backseater were killed. Um, so it, it uh, the 57 had a worse characteristic if you were dirty and got into mock tuck. You, there's no way out of it. The flight manual now, at least in the Air Force, said that, that you, uh, if you got into mock tuck, you ejected immediately. So, so you know, for for those who are not entirely familiar with the the aerodynamic phenomenon, mock tuck is caused, I think, by the shockwave moving behind the airplane, moving aft, and then covering the tailplane and the the elevator. Is that is that correct? Well, it causes a pitch down. So there's there's aerodynamic reasons why it does and. Mm-hmm. But but really... but it's a bad thing. So and it happens if you go too fast at uh, well at any altitude, I suppose. Well, too fast in a conventionally uh, configured airplane, okay. one that has a cambered wing and all that. And, and flutter is where the wingtips start rapidly oscillating up and down. Is that correct? And the failure mode for that is that the airplane disintegrates. Well, that the the oscillation um, uh, is not dampened; it, it feeds on itself. It's like it's bigger and bigger. Yeah, it's like uh, you know, in a swing, you push someone and they come back, and then you give them a little bit more push, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. But in the fifty-seven, it, it happened you know within a second it, it, or two seconds. It was just very very quick. No chance of ejection if if it happens to you then. Well, the chance is uh, if you see that it's going to happen. Right. It's, it's, but. The, uh, the big thing is don't get into that. Yeah. Just don't get into that, that area. So, so your U-2 flying then, that was um, not operational in the sense that you weren't going off and sort of flying missions to capture images of you know, sort of other, other countries or whatever. You were flying within continental U.S. doing those sorts of test missions. What, what did you, 
you know, what was your overall sense about the airplane then as a reconnaissance platform? What did you think of the camera systems? What did you think of um, the handling qualities, the ergonomics, the pilot interface? The, what were your thoughts? I liked it. It was good. I had no, uh, I mean, it was it was built, you know, in 1955. I think it was built in 54, flown in 55. Um, the A model, I, I was one of the last pilots to fly the A model. It's a uh, 722, and it's at the uh, it's at the Air Force Museum. I saw it just uh, last February, <laughs> hanging up in the ceiling. Uh, no, it, it, I I think it was a great airplane. I, I really enjoyed it, and it, I, I'm kind of the the reverse of claustrophobic. I like a tight cockpit, and the, the U2 is definitely a tight cockpit. Same thing as the 104. Exactly the same cockpit, same model, <laughs> everything, and it just uh, just you know, it's the old thing about feeling one with the airplane. And you, from a sort of photo taking point of view, then you have a little drift sight directly in front yeah. of you. You look down. That's the only way you've really gotten of knowing where the cameras are pointing. That's right. It, as it turns out, uh, again, one of my instructors in the U two told me how to take pictures. Uh, you get an ONC map, which from 60, 65,000 feet. The world looks like an ONC map. Mm -hmm. It's very easy to relate to that. So uh, the uh, the customer, the people who order the mission, tell me what they want to photograph, and it's usually an area. And so I uh, I know what the turning radius is, and and uh, you have a little certain overlap in this turning radius. So I just drew parallel lines along this area. I knew uh, the uh, beginning point, and, and I would to to get to the area. It was just a matter of doing navigation on the TAC end, uh, point to point navigation. So I can get there, and then once I'm there, I look at the at the ground to make sure that's where I am. You know, the lake is over here, and the mountains over here, and so, so all that stuff. And now now I'm set. So now on the drift site, I look at the drift site, and. Uh, and fly uh, one line. If you want to repeat the line, then you do a 90-270 turn, and you go right back over the same line because there's there's no wind up there, mm -hmm. 60,000 feet. Uh, I've never seen more than 10 knots of wind, and it was rare. So you're not worried about being blown off course or anything. The guys in the uh, uh, RF-101, for instance, really had to worry about it. Uh, oh, the, the ONC map, you, you have to use rubber cement and put it on a piece of um, cardboard and put it down by the side and then pick it up, look at that, now, drift site, go. That's how you do it. 